Above Wa is Luna One, a moon on which there is an atmosphere. A base was established in short time. However, leaving Luna One and going out into space results in a singular route revealing itself. Through this tunnel, one arrives at an elliptical structure, which was built at an unknown date. It is about a mile squared and contains living quarters, gardens, as well as immense computational and communication facilities. After establishing a base and dubbing the structure Mata, the expeditionary forces began to uncover and utilize the technology there. Chief among these was the ID, or intradimensional launch corridors, and the craft made for them. Because of the dusty state that Mata Base was found in, it was suggested that an older human race had built it and vanished. Others believe it was built and left to wait for our arrival. When expeditions were initially undertaken out of Mata Base, interest was given to worlds that looked Earth-like and inviting. Grass, too, was one of these. Just a pleasantly spring-like climate that caresses a field of short grass. It rises in some gentle hills which are graced with soft breezes. However, there are no animals, and the only thing of real interest that has been found is a rusty helmet left by a soldier, half buried in the ground, pierced with a spearhead. There is also a slight magnetic current present in the helmet. Grass, too, was also when the first iteration of the border phenomenon was discovered. Most of the worlds that are flat have borders, edges that are forbiddingly impenetrable. Even though some of these borders appear to have sights beyond flowers, hills, mountains, they cannot be reached and may as well be backdrops. This is not a cosmos as in our own outer space, but a constant slipstream between realms, sometimes cul-de-sacking with gaseous alcoves. Approach to a realm or world is unique. Entering some realms is akin to getting enveloped by a picture or a panorama. Other worlds are similar to planets in how they appear and are approached. The exospace is never totally black, but filled with clouds and other substances of many colors. It could be defined as ether, what was once thought to surround the Earth in space. For travel in the exospace, the most reliable and quick method is with the interdimensional shuttle. It is a large cargo ship capable of carrying two smaller aircraft, or one large aircraft, to carry a ground vehicle. The transport process is as follows. Mata Base has a map of the exospace. Each world on it corresponds to a specially fabricated pitch that has coordinates to the world. In the throne of each ID craft is housed a sphere of Saturnium, surrounded by a pitch ring, a band of silver inset with various pitches. When the throne becomes activated, it focuses the output from the fusion engine. The agitated sphere and ring spin until the energy spreads to the outer antennae. This generates a tunnel field, while phases the ship out of our space. After the proper coordinates are reached, the craft will phase back into normal exospace, and the throne will become inactive again. The Cygnus is a large jet aircraft with cargo space for several small land vehicles and other supplies. It has sleeping quarters as well. It also has a bomb bay and is capable to carry a payload of 50 megatons. If needed, it can land, deposit its cargo, and take off again in two minutes flat. Argonaut Fighter Jet A high-speed attack craft used in escorting shuttles as well as providing defense for landing craft. Each Argonaut can travel up to Mach 5 in the atmosphere and employs a G-dowser to alleviate some of the effects of high speed in order for the pilots to better maneuver in the case of a dogfight. Its armaments are two Vulcan cannons, nose-mounted, a plasma bolt launcher beneath the nose, and two snipe missiles on either wing, both yielding 50 kilotons each. A smaller variant, the Argonaut S, was developed for use by colonies, lighter and able to fend off any marauders that may come around. The Blue Jay is for missions where the personnel need to get in and get out on a moment's notice. A Blue Jay is equipped with an ion pulse rocket, allowing it to flee a planet in under a minute if necessary. While slowing down, it can shift to normal chemical afterburners and spread out wings for gliding in conventional flight. 
The BJ has two plasma turrets and an array of guns, survival suits, and other various equipment that may be essential on land. Most of the pilots of these jets are women, and each wear a gold headset which, in a way, gives them unprecedented views from outside the ship, adding the impression of being part of the aircraft itself. USIS Gettysburg, Atmospheric Excursion Vehicle Gettysburg is an AEV which can carry a whole exploratory team and its equipment and support vehicles down to a planet's surface. One can fit in an ID shuttle and so is often the sole cargo of such craft. An AEV can hold a wagon as well as any other ground vehicles needed to various tasks, such as vehicles may be a Vulcan driller or a Jeep, anything needed. The Gettysburg can be a home away from home with mess halls, rec rooms, and a small movie theater. Not to mention its plasma turrets and missile launchers that can target anything around a fair-sized globe. The ship can take off and land vertically and kick off into the sky with seven Mercury rockets and three ion pulse engines. Anderson High Altitude Rapid Transport The Anderson craft is one of the only vehicles smaller than an ID shuttle to implement a Saturnium core. Its classification of being high altitude is misleading, as it can exit the atmosphere and use its Saturnium to travel anywhere in the exospace. However, its power is limited and ideally it only travels to worlds that already have a well-established base. Its plush interiors are meant for important guests, such as high-ranking members of Mata Base, as well as representatives of the realms. As follows, here are some of the initial worlds discovered within the first five years of Mata Base's operation. None have yet seen the end of the city known as Anpia. It is a city in disrepair and decay, but in a very slow process. Most of the city is flat, tan, full of ghettos, always under a sun that beats down. Aircraft flying over the city have seen no end to the streets which extend into the horizon. Though this may be an illusion, investigations on land have had to turn back because of lack of supplies sufficient to endure the length of the city. There are timid populations that pepper the city, but most of the houses are empty. Yet all of these houses are different. It is not a special loop, as had been theorized earlier. Some areas have hills with closer groupings of buildings and more population. It is within these areas that one can find libraries and even a small art museum. The latter changes its exhibitions monthly. Though oddly the same painting has rarely been seen twice. This brought about publication of the Starrett Guide, an ongoing series of books published yearly cataloging all the paintings that have been seen in the Anpia Museum over the last 25 years. In the library, not many books tell of the city itself though there is one book written for young people and with a yellow dust jacket with crackling protective plastic. It mentions nighttime, when threatening gangs and packs of hyena hound-like animals roam. It says Anpia was built to be the biggest, fastest growing city ever. On the further regions there are many crumbling buildings, some that have fallen, even large square miles of concrete and cracked asphalt. Many of the houses are tan, with bricks set under plaster. There are recesses within these that appear like a basement for an unfinished structure, but they have been finished and resemble mazes more than anything, with seats and circular tunnels. Park Delta is similar to Grass 2, but has arrangements of trees and stone sculptures and even some small animal life. It is a pleasantly inviting world, a relaxing way station and resort for those weary of the strange vastness of the exospace. Much of the landscaping and structures are positioned around a central pond which reflects infrequent clouds and sunlight. One notable feature is the paragastric table. It is an arrangement of round stone seats in orbit of a large circular table. Early discoverers thought that it was suited for a race of long-bodied beings based on the distance of the seats from the table. The true function is exhibited by placing a morsel of food on the table and taking a seat. The food will become digested in one's own stomach. Luma 12 is a realm in a constant state of flux. Some ancient catastrophe has set space amok. What is left of the civilization is of a highly organic and enigmatic nature, as can be seen with the disassembled house, 
a name given to a sort of unstable structure that seems to quiver and rise and fall in the atmosphere. The floor is a thick mist that turns to white sand or powder and is very reflective. Floating in the ether, Ambrosia is an untraceable city of wood and bronze. Its rooms and corridors and multi-layered streets are dim and calm. It's assumed that this world must have been inhabited judging by the art and sculpture left behind. A torso is one of the few surviving likenesses of them, but it is doubtful if it represents their true appearance. Aside from its chief export being coal, this world features thousands of tall, vibrating antennas. Their signals pierce the white sky above, and little else. Triple Cedar, the wooden labyrinth, is filled with mysteries and dusty libraries full of books with indecipherable languages. Lurking also in the corners of its darker halls are bony organisms called woodnuts that reproduce by contact with their own kind, or simply on their own. Because of this, they sometimes crowd halls and have to be pulverized. One ingenious foil for this obstacle are the replication dowsers. They are cages whose construction tricks certain geometrical observations in the woodnut's perception, causing them to plant themselves to the frame of the cage. This curtails their populations. Also present is the blockhouse. It is a maze within a maze, with winding tunnels and uneven rooms. The wood, extracted, smooths over where cuts are made. Double X is another abandoned world filled with old, musty corridors. WX also has rows of drawers that are filled with papers of carefully drawn hieroglyphics. It evidently tells of the conversion of some lower form of energy to a higher one. This world was instrumental in understanding certain technology left in Matabase. At the time of this discovery, the main mode of travel through the exospace was by chemical rocket-propelled shuttle. This would only take days to reach some worlds, However, the ID technology at Mata Base, with the applied WX notes, allowed the expediting of travel to mere minutes. On the dark, powdery dirt of Night Midian is the City of Light. It is a self-luminous series of levels and squared chambers. Once the city was explored thoroughly enough, there were found amenities for human accommodation. Outside the city, it is a different matter. There it is perpetually twilight, and the ground is not unlike chocolate powder, but quite incapable of supporting plant life. Zebra One is what is known as a moving force labyrinth. Highly concentrated forms of energy held by a central invisible gravity well move, merge, and interact. Some flicker in and out of sight. Often huge walls of color will rise against which black and white swaths move like dancers. There is no ground on which to touch down, and it would be dangerous to attempt that on one of the energy forms. Because of that danger, there are zebra divers, people who descend by tether and vernier suit into this bizarre and compelling world to try and plumb its mysteries. The non-dead zone was almost included among the dead world's classification. However, its nature precluded that decision. The reason being that the non-dead zone, being a large aggregation of salt, has living organisms on it. The creatures are composed entirely of various types of self-congregating sodium chloride. They almost always resemble women when forming. Most likely, this is because the first explorer to be seen by them in this region was a woman, Marilyn Oberman. Otherwise, the salt remains in a flat, moving current and is strikingly varied in color. Pompanon is a lozenge-shaped realm with chambers and spaces of near-perfect color that graduate into regions of other colors. Humidity and temperatures are often high, and the difficulty in seeing some walls is alleviated by the splotches of acrylicon. This is thick, pigmented growth, stimulated by the low frequencies and mineral quality of the walls. Often, the acrylicon arranges in vertical stripes or large rectangles. In some regions of Pompanon, the progressive portals recede through degrees of color and luminance to produce beautiful, disquieting effects. Compound 53 is a maze. The realm provides all kinds of random information, none of which is extractable. All the thousands of displays are fixed in their purposes. 
Some displays have been thought to indicate the consciousnesses of a score of unidentified persons. They appear to be in stasis, and the male consciousness are crossing over to synchronize with certain female ones. Whether these people are located somewhere within C-53 or rest elsewhere has yet to be seen. Tauros is a realm of wood-walled corridors and chambers comprising a vast interior area. On many walls, a fuzzy growth appears. The fur moves slightly as if blown by a gentle breeze, though there is none. They reproduce by releasing the white spores on the ends of the hairs. They are harmless to people and merely provide an odd decoration to the quiet and warm carpeted halls. Otranto Gamma is primarily a desert world. Under its cold climate are scattered the traces of a lost civilization. The burial maze is a labyrinth of channels dug 20 feet into the dirt. Some rags and mask-like carvings in the walls are the only decoration. No bones have yet been found. Elsewhere is a sprawling city, thousands of years old. Most of the roofs are gone, but some columns remain. Marina B is a planetoid, a sphere of gravitational influence that holds a small ocean. The ocean is dotted with a few islands and was devoid of sea life when discovered, but was soon populated by the Bio Battalion. Though the water is not salinized, it does contain other minerals in it. The few islands there are make it a prime location for testing submersible equipment as well as a good vacation spot. 802701 is one of a few flat rectangular worlds. Mostly pastoral, there are mountains girding the four perimeter walls. Strange structures and statues are positioned around the center. Some of these are libraries and museums, immaculately maintained, and yet uninhabited since discovery. A wispy creature known as the Aloa floats around. The body is a mass of rippling blue-gray tatters, at night it wanders the forests, delivering a soft, siren-like call that renders most living things docile and prone to suggestion. Usually these calls come in intervals of a few hours, but more frequent occasions can mean that some new danger is near. Anyone going into 820K wears an emitter, a silver triangular pin which has its own frequency that negates Iloa's hypnotic influence. Tri-Dragon, Cream Space, is an unstable area of cream-colored liquid. Inside are some small planetoids. Life on these ranges from minute, living black holes to tough, white, blob-like creatures. The cream itself provides great visibility inside, while adding a polarizing effect to certain light sources outside and within the area. The liquid, in fact, can be breathed. However, this is not to be done for extended periods of time, since a person's lungs will become irritated and inflamed. A secret hub of the exospace is Paprika Manor, a brick house that sits as a rest stop and a way station. The ground is like astroturf and is a condensed space itself. The basement of Paprika House goes down for about a hundred feet or so and expands about as much on either side. The house is meant for comfort, but a temporary comfort. It floats amidst blown-up views of old earth and undefined regions. The forest and the farm under overcast skies. There are even various gardening equipment or wooden panels placed out on the green turf. And flying to and fro around the space are the fetchers. Clear, glittering spheres which bring gifts of candy as well as messages from friends and strangers. Acacia Plot is known as the snack bar of the exospace. It's a magnificent and serene patch of greenery and an even autumnal splendor. At its center is an establishment of fascinating design. It is a recreational center, cafeteria, museum, and theater. All of it carpeted, painted, and papered in colorful patterns of psychedelia. Appliances like clocks are sometimes placed in unusual spots, as are signs and balconies that open to the tempered air. If nothing else, the mystery is augmented by the amusement. Phosphia is a tiny world made of phosphorus. It has one ocean, more like a vast lake. It is one of the only worlds in exospace to be inhabited by aliens. These Phosphians are known to be beings of instant familiarity. The truth of this, and more, can be learned in a famous story concerning the planet. One explorer, Captain Groves, 
entered the Phosphian atmosphere and immediately suffered a malfunction of his aircraft's engines. Knowing that a crash landing on this world would cause an explosive chain reaction that would destroy not only its surface, but the inhabitants as well, Captain Groves crash landed in the sea, bailing out at the last second. He washed ashore, exhausted. There he was found by a Phosphian. Her name, her true name, would have looked something like an oscillogram, since her language was radio-based. She had never seen a human before, and stood over him. She dried him with her long hair-like fibers, and soon he revived. This is when the most stunning thing about Phosphians was discovered. When Captain Groves made eye contact with Eclair, the name she would later be given, her glowing pink eyes probed into his mind and soul. This is part of the Phosphian communication system, and eye contact is the result of an intimate relationship. So then, Eclair understood Captain Groves, but he could not perceive all of her, though he received her well. They sat on the beach in silence. Eclair made vocal sounds only for strong emotive moments. Groves taught her to form those into words. He would not leave her side. Their bond was cemented the second they had met eyes. When they were picked up, Captain Groves wanted Eclair to return with him, as he wouldn't leave without her. Eclair wanted to leave as well, to experience the outside realms. She bade goodbye to her kin and left. With the aid of a special containment suit, she was soon acclimated to our environments. A precaution was also made to cover her eyes, to prevent her from over-manipulating everyone she came into sight of. She told Captain Groves that once when she was on Phosphia, she saw in the sky a glittering white object that seemed ringed with a rainbow plane. This was in fact Opalia Castle, a mythical castle that sits atop an enormous iceberg. According to some explorers' tales, this is the place where those who have mastered the exospace live, or it is a heavenly city that once entered cannot be exited. True to Eclair's story, the first sign of approach to Apalia Castle is supposed to be a plane of prismatic glass that extends forward when approaching the castle from any direction. And Captain Groves and Eclair search these cosmos for that fabled palace. The surface of Kadava is made of dark red stones and laced with rivers of magma. Although it was once populated by a mighty civilization, a few scrappers are yet to vanish. In a cave of fire, there is a massive idol known as the War God. This statue is made of fused metal left over from the last people. In some situations, the statue has been seen to bend slightly or turn its sun-like head. It emits radio signals which are methodical but indecipherable. The Dead Worlds are five forbidden realms in the exospace, access to which has been prohibited by the Mata Command. The reason for this ranges from extreme violations of human rights by the colonies thereon, or for their dangerous conditions. Only specially approved missions can approach or set down on one of these worlds. M2 was once a production world before all contact was lost. However, it is now known for the fate of its inhabitants. The entire surface had been converted to blocky residences and warehouses. The production facilities were underground, and merely circulated items from those into the residences, where the refuse was then reintegrated into the production. What human life was really like is hard to ascertain without a proper survey. However, the truth is most likely a grim one. Whether it was a delayed condition of the planet, or something loosed by the industry, all the inhabitants died, or rather, were placed into a forever sleep. On the first visit, there one lone survivor was picked up who told the tale. Somehow, when sleeping, people's bodies began to mineralize and fall apart. Then, upon waking, they would reassemble. After some time, people slept and did not wake up, and less and less were able to stay awake. Therefore, scattered throughout the world are pieces of statues of varying colors and crystallization. The last survivor being brought off-world cured his affliction. Tranquilia is a world of fine, pale green sand and fine grass which grows in some regions. The planet is one of the dead worlds for the reason that it is home to the Ango. The Ango were a species of beings which resembled black skeletons. 
theories as to what happened to them range from them causing their own demise to being wiped out in some mysterious manner. However, a more likely theory entails them being made dormant. As of now, only the ruins of their civilization remain. They built their buildings from stone blocks, many of great size and interior complexity. Much of the walls demonstrate pictures which show various activities and the annals of the Ango. One of the early expeditions to this world uncovered a tomb. Inside was the head of an Ango. It was smooth and matte and totally black, with no trace of eyes or other orifices. At first it was thought to be a stone carved in the likeness of the vanished race, but the stone was actually a kind of dense bone, but not entirely. It began to regenerate the rest of its body. Upon completion, it became violent and communication was impossible. The explorers were forced to flee because they could not find any way to stop it short of blasting it with plasma. Since then, any spacecraft landing there is liable to be attacked by an Ango, as others, it seems, have risen from other tombs. No expedition is permitted to land on Tranquilia unless given approval and equipped with the right weaponry, as the Ango are fast and strong enough to pound through steel. Plastoria holds a horrible epitaph of a dead society. In the labyrinth of sun-drenched plaster are cool interiors lit by fluorescent lamps. Their indifferent hum still mingles with the musty air. Some unknown parachemical virus with mineral properties must have run amok. Its effects spread in unthinkable permutations. Patient Zero was found on a hospital table the harbinger of the final days of this civilization. The less known about the fate of that woman, the better. Volkos is a terrible, hostile world, and was an early discovery during exploration. It has fierce radiation storms. Mining was established on the planet because of the rich deposits of uranium, gold, copper, and cobalt. However, the colony was forced to remain underground because of the phosphine creature, called the Blue Banshee. Composed of animated blue radiation, it has multiple eyes and what resembles wispy hair. Its presence is toxic, and it destroys whatever it touches. It is hard to determine where it will be on Volkos at any one time. It is seen most often above the half-melted ruins of the first civilization that lived here. What all explorers have sought is Opalia Castle, the threshold of paradise. It is a castle whose walls are made of polished opal. It sits on an island of ice that drifts through the exospace, between it and beyond. There is no fixed position for it, and to encounter it is to be blessed. Its gatekeeper is Eclair, the Phosphian, who found Opalia with Captain Groves, her companion. After crossing the rainbow and mirrored plains, the silver gates of the castle opened, and there, to greet them, were two very tall white horses. Their forms were so elongated for horses that they resembled giraffes. Their manes were blue, and so uncannily, they resembled Eclair. One of them leaned forward and delivered a message to Eclair. It told her that she must stay and be the gatekeeper of the castle. Unquestioningly, she accepted, recognizing the charge as her destiny. While at the gate, she was dressed in new clothes, miraculously, including a new golden visor to cover her eyes. Captain Groves very much did not want to leave her, but Eclair promised him that they would meet again at the end of time. One other member of the crew, who will remain nameless, was invited by Eclair to enter the castle. She revealed her eyes to him in order to judge his heart. Captain Groves and the rest were given gold cards by Eclair and the steeds of Opalia, so that even though they weren't permitted to stay there yet, the discovery and memory of the place and its promise would enrich them throughout their lives. Finally, they all left the island of ice, back across the Rainbow Plain, and from Grove's ship watched Opalia Castle float away into the mysterious cosmos. It is believed that those who will enter heaven first wait at Opalia Castle until all are gathered. Since then, more worlds have been discovered, each more strange and marvelous than the last, but the exospace is just the beginning of what lies beyond our own space and time. For there is also the realm of Vorta, where dwell Archeo and the other lesser gods. Their explication will have to wait for another day. <laughs>